Hey folks, how are you? Thanks for tuning in again. Okay, here's some promised content. Uh, I'm getting motivated. I'm getting started. Let's get into it. I'm just going to start covering some eucalyptus species. So uh, you should have the video there on, you know, eucalyptus versus Angophora versus Carimbia, uh, the theory there, which I, I really sort of uploaded. I really did. Uh, the Angophora video is still there. The Carimbia video is still there. I'm probably not going to redo those, but I'm really trying to pump these out. Uh, remember, I've got a New South Wales focus. I've been running some uh, New South Wales uh, based eucalyptus ID workshops just to help out some consultants uh, and some other people. So uh, in the workshop, we just basically focus on some common eucalypts of Sydney and these PowerPoints have been put together basically focusing on some really common Sydney eucalypts. Uh, the first day of the workshop covers sandstone eucalypts, the ones that are more commonly found on sandstone. And the second day normally covers the shale and sort of river flat or alluvium uh, eucalypts. So it's got a bit of a Sydney focus, but a lot of those eucalypts go much further afield than Sydney. But in these uh, videos, I'll just cover as many species as I can some common New South Wales, mainly coastal species that you can get familiar with. And look, I just hope they, they help you and um, you find them uh, interesting, uh, I guess, yeah. Uh, Bean eucalyptus, uh, I'm sure if you're watching these, you like the idea of tall trees. Uh, and I won't be covering species like, you know, the, the magnificent eucalyptus regnans, uh, Australia's tallest tree, the second tallest tree in the world, reportedly. Uh, the tallest flowering plant in the world. Uh, that's the mountain ash uh, down in Victoria, Tasmania, eucalyptus regnans. But if you're familiar with that plant or you want to learn about it, you should find that it has the same features as some of the eucalypts I'm covering here. Um, so, you know, they all share these common features. But uh, just two that I've got here, which, uh, yeah, you might be interested in. Uh, this is a eucalyptus viminalis, a ribbon gum. Not covering this one just yet, but maybe I can in a future video. Uh, this likes to grow a lot on creek lines in inland New South Wales, but has a bit of a wide range, gets into the drier country as well. This was near Bathurst, uh, and they were sort of the tallest viminalis I'd ever seen, uh, getting up to about 40 metres. So a lot of eucalypts can fall into that 40, 50, 60 metre uh, sort of bracket. That's, that's a big tree in Australia, but... Um, there's a fair few that, that fall into that sort of range. Uh, this was an absolute memorable stunner. Um, this is probably on volcanic soil in the southern highlands, a good bit of basalt. And my mate there is about six foot six, a lot taller than me, and I'm up on a grassy hill trying to capture this whole tree. But that's a beautiful eucalypt, which I think is readily identifiable. That's eucalyptus quadrangulata. It gets called the white topped box or the white tipped box i think it might also get called coastal gray box by some people but sort of kicks in there down the south coast of new south wales even as you get to wollongong and go on to kiama kangaroo valley and the southern highlands but uh you know we gave this one about 50 meters it's it's quite spectacular and this was a really nice this was a farm but we just went down into the guts of the farm and on the road, the main road where you drive through here in East Barrel, there's no indication at all that there's massive trees around. There's, there's just no indication. You've got to get off the road, try and get onto some people's farms and then come right down the hill from the farmhouse, which will be up top of the hill or the mansion in this case, <laughs> get down into the valley and you've got beautiful basalt volcanic soil and these massive trees. Uh, you've got other species like Cypelacarpa, monkey gum, and fastigator, brown barrel, and obliqua, uh, messmate, all growing together here. But but I sometimes think the quadrangulatas are the tallest ones. They're just really beautiful. So let's just plough in. Look, I'm really going to try and keep these videos to half an hour. Uh, let's see how we go. I'm going to get to the 30 minute 40 minute mark and then just cut it and then i'll go on to other species in the next one i'll just keep trying to roll uh just remember when you get into eucalyptus remember we're looking at 700 to 900 950 some people will say a thousand species 
and you just get a lot of variation in basically everything that's going on. So uh, a lot of group of eucalypts are called gums, uh, red gum, blue gum, grey gum, yellow gum, uh, probably some other names as well, but um, forest gum and things like that. Uh, gum is usually defined as a eucalypt that has a really smooth trunk and not a lot of bark that you can pull off with your bare hands. The trunk is very smooth. There's bark there, but it almost doesn't seem like there is. It's, it's sort of just like a bit of stem covering. But every year or every two years, they do go through a bark shedding process and then it's a, they, they sort of dry that outer layer out. It all curls up and it falls off. Then it's very obvious that they do have bark. You might be able to pull off some fibrous plates at the bottom uh, or near the ground level, uh, some chunky plates, but you'll see that most of the chunk is smooth and if you run your hand up and down, it's, it's very hard to pull any sort of chunks of bark off. So that's what we mean by gums. Remember, we get some angophras called gums as well, like Sydney red gum. Um, iron barks, they're a very conspicuous groups of eucalypts. They've got a very hard, furrowed, chunky bark and it's very hard to pull off huge bits with your bare hands. You can pull off crumbs and little uh, chunks, but if you want to pull off a whole half metre strip of bark, that's it's very hard without, say, a hammer and chisel or something like that. Uh, we call those iron barks, and they're normally black to grey in colour. There's not really too many brown iron barks. They're, they're black to grey. They're really interesting, and they're known for having really hard timber, um, which are historically good for making fences and railway sleepers and that sort of thing. Boxes. Uh, a lot of ukes called boxes. Uh, they tend to have these sort of wine glass, champagne glass looking fruits and they have this finely tessellated bark, a bit like a sort of almost a jigsaw puzzle or mosaic sort of arrangement, uh, very finely tessellated. And a lot of the time the upper branches are bare, but that's what we mean by boxes. Stringy barks, they have nice brown, very long fibrous bark from the top to the bottom, normally all the way up to the terminal branches. And you can pull off these big, long belt-like strips of bark. You can uh, grab a bit with your hands and run it up and you, you get this nice sort of strap of bark coming off the, the tree. Fibrous, brown, that's what we mean by stringy barks. They're a very complicated group, hard to identify confidently in some cases. You, you have to sort of uh, eventually make a decision with all the information available, what's the most likely stringy bark um, you have. Um, mahoganies, they're interesting. They're probably name that because the timber was considered similar to, to the earlier mahoganies that the Europeans discovered. They can have a stringy bark or they can have a part stringy bark and upper bare branches. Um, they can have a strongly tessellated bark. Uh, they can look like a stringy bark from a distance and you have to look at the fruit and leaves overall to realise that you don't have a stringy bark but you might have a mahogany. Uh, there's a whole group of cool eucalypts called peppermints. Uh, they have very short fibrous bark, almost sort of verging on sawdust in some cases, but very shortly, finely fibrous. And if you scratch your hand over the trunk, the bark easily sort of sheds away in these very uh, fibrous, dusty bits. The leaves, they've got a very strong peppermint smell, not so much of a eucalypts to smell, but more of a peppermint smell. We've got a whole heap of mallies. Uh, short, generally, multi-stemmed eucalypts up to about five metres tall that grow very commonly in the inland areas of New South Wales. We also have some coastal mallies, but they have normally multiple very narrow stems up to five metres tall. They keep re-sprouting from a lignotuber. They make very good garden specimens, mallies, because you know, no one wants the eucalypt these days in their garden that's going to get to 40 metres high. But if you can get some of these Australian mallies to grow, and I think there's a lot of them that just haven't been trialled well enough in horticulture, especially some Sydney ones even, they're very beautiful plants in the garden. Um, and you can just keep cutting them back and they'll keep reshooting. So they've got a multi-stemmed habit. Um, to about five metres tall most of the time. There's also another type like mallies called mallets. 
um, and they're meant to be a single stemmed mallee, which possibly don't have that capacity to re-sprout from a lignotuber. They might be obligate cedars, but you get mallets in uh, Western Australia. When I got introduced to this term, I thought the guy who was sort of writing the article talking about mallets just kept putting in a typo. He sort of meant to say mallies, but no, there is a group called mallets um, and very similar to mallies. So look out for those. Uh, we have some ukes called ashes. I don't really know what defines an ash. Uh, I'm going to cover one of the ashes soon in, in this uh, these videos. The tallest tree in Australia, like I said, is called the mountain ash. Uh, normally they have a half bark, a half trunk of fibrous coarse bark, and then they have upper bare branches. Maybe they've got particular looking fruits and particular shedding of bark, but we have a whole heap that people have called ashes. And then you can get some individual and sort of unique ones, I guess, like messmate, brown barrel, uh, eucalyptus fastigator, um, the yitchuk, uh, eucalyptus considiniana, a one called black butt, which I'm going to cover, black sally, uh, a tree that grows in cold areas, uh, normally in, in areas prone to snow as well. Um, the whole box and dice sort of thing. So you get a lot of, uh, you know, you can get a, a tree called argyle apple, which is a eucalypt. So you get all of these sort of unique sort of, you know, I guess what I'd call individual names as well, which are hard to group. But just bear in mind that the botanists over time have recognised formal subgenera. We have subgenera like monocalyptus, and obviously that means that the, there's only one bud cap on the flowers and not two. There's one called Symphiomyrtus. Uh, uh, there's, there's all these subfamilies and subgenera that have been recognised within the eucalypts, possibly with some discussion that if eucalyptus was ever split up further, you could go into those subgenera. But uh, we're all hoping we get to keep this name, uh, which, you know, most people say is iconically Australian. Just remember, eucalyptus aren't purely confined to Australia naturally. Uh, they go right up to the Philippines in Southeast Asia, Papua New Guinea, uh, places like that. Um, but we, Australia has about 98%, uh, if that's right, 98%, 99% of all the species. Uh, and we know now that eucalyptus have been planted in many parts around the world. Uh, in America, they're really starting to hate them now because they're really causing some, some really bad wildfires or really adding to the wildfires. So um, becoming a bit of a controversial genus. But we are uh, taking an Australian perspective, you know, our, our beautiful tree. So just remember, I put this in the first video on the theory, but if you've got a eucalyptus, uh, the juvenile leaves will be opposite. Uh, in the seedling stage, they will be opposite. And there's a lot of variety about how quickly those juvenile leaves go from opposite to alternate or the subsequently produced leaves start to be alternate. So you might get five pairs of opposite leaves and then they you start getting alternate leaves. You might get 10 pairs of opposite leaves and then you start going alternate. What I'm trying to do consistently is refer to the juvenile leaves for some species as to whether they're helpful for identification. A lot of the time they are, but sometimes they're not. Then the adult leaves are alternate uh, unless the juvenile foliage is retained into the adult plant. And some examples of that are eucalyptus cinerea, the argyle apple, and pulvera lenta. Both of these are very common in cultivation. I think eucalyptus cinerea is very useful for making eucalyptus oil. Um, they're two examples. They have very conspicuous foliage. They're very easily identifiable, short of sort of short round blue leaves that are pretty much opposite or possibly a little bit sub opposite or disjunct alternate we might call that um so that's an example of some species retaining the juvenile foliage um and i just said there are around 250 species in new south wales the same deal with corimbia at the moment as far as we sort of know uh not considering the publication done in 2024 by Crisp et al. But 
eucalyptus flowers. They've got the bud cap. That's what they're known for. Corimbia has that as well. And that bud cap is a fusion of the petals and sepals, which falls off to open the flower. Or when the flower opens, it just squeezes that bud cap off. Some flowers have two calyptrae and they have they have two bud caps and some carimbia have that as well uh i think i showed that in the video but uh the petals and sepals aren't there they've gone they that they, they were they were making up the bud cap and that's gone so when you have nice open eucalyptus flowers and they are beautiful as we know but you call them an incomplete flower because there's parts that are missing or parts that have been shed off so you can have complete flowers and incomplete flowers in botany and, and eucalypts are a great example of an incomplete flower. Uh, there's no petals and sepals there. Uh, the inflorescences, so how the flowers are arranged. Remember we've got um, the umbelaster. The buds are put into that umbel or that umbelaster or if you liked my numeric explanation, it's also a condensed dicasia because you're going from three buds to seven buds to seven to 15 to 15 to 31. It's it's a mathematical progression, but we'll call them umbels, umbelasters, and sometimes these are arranged, you know, solitary in the leaf axils, but sometimes they're grouped into, you know, panicle-like, raceme-like, botria-like clusters. And they can sometimes be mainly at the terminal uh, at the terminus of the branches out there beyond the foliage. But a lot of the time they're intermingled in the foliage. They're down in the leaf axles. And you get the whole, you know, box and dice here. Remember with Angophora carimbia, we've got nice terminal flowers out there. Um, very conspicuous. Eucalyptus, you can get, you know, whole leafy branches of flowers when they're down in the leaf axles. Fruit. Wide variety of shapes and sizes, not usually urn-shaped. I do know some eucalypts with urn-shaped, almost carimbia-looking fruit, um, and I'm going to show one of those probably in the next video. With the disc level or raised and with valves inserted, rim level, or they might say enclosed, enclosed or inserted, rim level, exerted to strongly exerted. So we're getting the whole thing here. Remember in carimbia, the disc is well and surely sunk in the fruit uh, and the valves are because of that are, are really inserted as well or enclosed. Uh, eucalyptus, you get in the whole, you know, sort of kit and caboodle, I guess, you know, again, with 900 species, um, you're going to get just so much variation. And what I said about the, t the bark in the types in the last slide, wide variety, smooth, part, full, iron bark, stringy bark, some eucalypts are shed you know, these long ribbons. They have these long ribbons coming off the upper branches and hanging down towards the ground. And that can be a useful identifying feature for some. So just remember all that. Uh, and I'm trying to move on. Yeah, look, I'm going straight into it. So let's get into it and see how we go. Look, remember at the workshop, we started with Hawkesbury Sandstone Eucalypts. And uh, that was the focus for day one. So that's the sort of approach I'm taking here. But you can take this as, um, you know, common Sydney eucalypts, common New South Wales coastal eucalypts, especially from maybe, you know, Newcastle south along the, along the Sydney coast and down further. Um, and we'll see how many we can cover. I'll, I'll just keep going on. Scribbly gums, that's where we start. Um, interesting group of gums they're sort of localized to the sydney area generally or the greater sydney area so if you go you got these really conspicuous trunks which we'll have a look at but if you go around large parts of australia you won't find them unless you come to i'll say the sydney area there's exceptions there's some that go right up north uh, to queensland up the coast and then there's one there's there's a taxa that goes a taxon that goes inland as well into inland New South Wales, but the scribbly gums are short, sort of known for being strongly associated with the Greater Sydney area and you know further afield. But you know that's that's just really interesting. There's there's no scribbly gum in Western Australia or Tasmania or Victoria, um, anything like that. There's only five species historically. Now, this is a bit of a dog's breakfast, and I've got to get through this, but 
we had five species. And what I remember is there's one H, two R's and two S's. And historically, everyone's saying there's a lot of variation observed and intergradation, and it can be hard to pin down which species you have in some cases. In 2004, my old uh, botanical supervisor at Sydney Uni, good old Murray Henwood, uh, helped uh, Brendan File, who was a PhD student, do a study on the scribbly gums. And Brendan File concluded in 2004 that there's really only three taxa. There's Eucalyptus hemostoma, and you can put Eucalyptus sclerophylla and signata into Eucalyptus racemosa, subspecies racemosa, and Eucalyptus rossii becomes racemosa, subspecies rossii. And a, so a fair bit of lumping there. Um, this got rejected by the other botanists at the time, people like, I think, Ken Hill uh, and, and sort of eucalypt experts like that. Based on the methodology that was used, uh, the morphometrics and, and what we'd call the, you know, the, the what do they call it, um, phonetics, I think, uh, I'm getting my terms mixed up in my botany taxonomy now, but the methodology used, they argued, wasn't really applicable to what these ukes were sort of doing and exhibiting. I don't pretend to be an expert on that. I'm not going to get into that. But if you get on the really cool uh, Australian government eucalypt resource, Euclid, and it's a really primary port of call for eucalypts, you should be going to that first and looking at what they're saying. They seem to be running with this. They're happy to run with this. They've accepted that there's no difference to warrant recognising sclerophylla and signata. There's just no difference. On the New South Wales flora website, PlantNet, what we affectionately call in New South Wales, eucalyptus sclerophylla doesn't have a page anymore. And if you look up these guys, they seem to be in a state of flux. And I think a lot of genetic variation is currently going on. So watch this space is what I'm saying. And it's that typical case I'm giving you is that we keep mucking around with these things. Uh, the classification isn't quite concrete. And if you're going to go from five species to what we call three taxa, uh, one species and two, well, two species with two subspecies, um, I, I'm happy with that. I mean, I don't mind that. If, if people are having trouble uh, discerning these things, then uh, a bit of lumping. Look, I'm, I'm a bit of a lazy botanist. I'm always happy with that. So uh, New South Wales flora, they've abandoned sclerophylla, but the four other species currently remain. The main differences are geographic location, fruit size and leaf width. There's some variation there. Eucalyptus rossii, it occurs, it's the western scribbly gum or the inland scribbly gum. It's a scribbly gum you get on hilltops around Bathurst and Goulburn and uh, going out to Parks and Forbes and I think it gets out that far, possibly Dubbo as well if it gets out that far. And, you know, in, in the key, they sort of said if the plant's found west of the Blue Mountains, it's rossii. And if it's fast of the Blue Mount Coast, well, it's going to be one of the other four. Well, we say, what if you don't know where the specimen come? If you're trying to identify this eucalypt specimen, you've got no idea where it came from, which could be the case, then that key's not going to work. So we need something better than geographic location. So umbalasters of all species, they're typically 7 to 15, usually 11 to 15 or 9 to 15. You can see that in my photo here. And I'm pretty sure this one is eucalyptus hemostoma on some Hawkesbury sandstone outcrop just north of Sydney in the Brisbane waters area. Uh, they tend to have these large, wide, juvenile leaves that smell really strongly. They've got a really strong eucalyptus hint. I like to crush them and smell them. And they're typically a strongly blue-green colour. There's no sort of evidence of that here with this um, hemostoma. But they're typically a sort of bluey green. You can see a little bit of it there. And the fruit have a red disc, valves, um, to about 11 millimetres wide. Um, and I just want to really show you that in the next slide. I, I, I'm pretty sure this is eucalyptus hemostoma. And... In hemostoma, the fruits get the largest of any species. They get up to 11 mil. 
And these fruits are beautiful. This is a really ripe stage. This is how you find them. And hemostoma relates to that, you know, things like hemoglobin in our blood. It means red mouth or red opening. That's pretty much what it means. And it's referring to this red disc here on the fruit. The valves are going to open and it's got this beautiful red um, disc. So uh, that's what we mean by hemostoma. But of course, the other scribbly gums have that as well. But they're a lot smaller. They're smaller in size. Um, here's what I mean by the umbilasters being clustered into some sort of, you know, panicle, raceme. I don't mean to have the pulse on it, whatever you want to call it. But you can see that you're getting clusters of the umbilasters here. There's an umbilasta, there's an umbilasta, there's an umbilasta. And, you know, you can count the buds, you know, 9, I don't know, 11, um, 10, you know, you get in the whole box and die. So you can see that some are broken off there. So that's what you get in the scribbly gums. Nice, not very big staminate flowers when they open, but they're nice. And um, they detract bees and flying foxes and everything. Scribbly gum woodlands in New South Wales can be very dramatic. I think they make for great photos. They're just, you sort of go, wow. Like, and if you get them on a sunny day or a rainy day, if you're a photographer, a landscape photographer, they're, they're really nice. This is a patch where I see a lot of scribbly gum is down in the Canyon Lee area of New South Wales. It's, it's down towards Goulburn off the Hume Highway in the Southern Highlands. And this is probably going down as eucalyptus sclerophylla. But I would now be calling it Rasamosa subrasamosa or Rasamosa subsclerophylla. But a lot of these patches in the past have been referred to as sclerophylla, and you get these really beautiful um, patches. This is Belangolo State Forest. Just note that the bark of the scribbly gum does shed. So you can get this sort of thing going on for most of the year, but then. It'll dry out, curl up, go grey, and it'll start to shed off. So they do have a bark shedding process. Uh, yeah, Belangolo State Forest here. Um, it's not too far from the earlier photo. Beautiful scribbly gum patch. This will typically always be very sandy soil. Very sandy, sandstone rock lying about. Plateau, ridge top. That's where you get in the scribbly gum. Once you start going down into the gullies to the creek lines, typically the scribbly gum will drop out and other eucalypts will come in. So it's a very shrubby, dry, prickly sort of woodland. And normally scribbly gums, normally they're not that tall. They, they can get up to 20 metres, 25 metres. But a lot of these woodlands, you'll have trees to 14, 16 metres, not, not 12, 10 metres, not overly higher than that. That's another Canyon Lee patch. Heap of uh, eucalyptus, sclerophylla, racemosa, juveniles here with nice big leaves. What I'll quickly throw in is you can get another white trunked eucalypt in here, which I'll try and cover much later. It's called eucalyptus manifera, manigum. It's very common in the inland parts of New South Wales. And in here, this particular plot, I'm just doing a sampling plot. I had to watch out for it. I had to take some time to discern that there was manifera here. Now, manifera will have generally narrow leaves. It can have a very white trunk. It normally has buds in sevens. And if you do a bit of lazy botany, which I always like, remember, you rub your hand up and down the trunk of manifera and you get a white powder all over your hands. And that's why it's called managum. You get this white powder, this gray powder over your hands. You never get that with a scribbly gum. I've never rubbed a scribbly gum trunk and gotten white powder on my hands, but I do do it in the field regularly to try and determine whether I've got some manifera um, in amongst the scribbly gum. So there's always lookalikes. Uh, we watch out for that. Now, I'm just, this is my photo of, of scribbles. I'm sure I've got a few, but this is one I found. I just want to make sure this isn't confusing. I was photographing the slug at the same time. The slug isn't causing the scribbles. The scribbles and this slug have nothing to do with each other. I just got this slug and there was a bit of a hit on Facebook at one point where everyone was photographing these. They were coming out in the wet weather, I think, and they're just these funky Australian slugs with this white red diamond on them. Some viewers might know the name of them. I've even forgotten the name, but 
Um, I think I was capturing the slug more than the scribbles, but the scribbles are caused by the scribbly gum moth. And they're a very small moth. And I think there's only a couple of species known in Australia and they will lay their eggs on the trunk and the larvae of the moth will eat through the outer bark layer and cause these beautiful scribbles and all these beautiful random patterns. Uh, you wonder why they don't just go in a straight line. Uh, they, they love going in a scribble. So it makes for beautiful patterns on the trunk. So just again, the, the slug has nothing to do with the scribbles, but that's caused by a scribbly gum moth. Scribbly gums aren't the only gums that get scribbles. There's a couple of others you can observe scribbles on as well, but they're very prominent on the scribbly gums. Eucalyptus pilularis, black butt. I see that with scribbles on the upper branches. And I think eucalyptus seberi, uh, silver top ash, both of those I'm going to show uh, in a later video. They also can get scribbles, I think. So they're not just the scribbly gums. Uh, just throwing in historic records, eucalyptus hemostoma. You can see it's got a strong Sydney concentration up to Newcastle, very coastal. Remember, it has the biggest fruit up to 11 mil. Uh, records down here, you know, could be hemostoma, could be racemosa. These are probably some, might be some botanic garden specimens. When you see a dot in Canberra, it's only a botanic garden specimen, but that's generally the range. You can see Rasamosa has historically been recorded right up here on the New South Wales coast, right out here. Um, just the way it goes, whether they were Rasamosa or Rossii or who knows. Just check out Rossii. It's got a very inland distribution. So if you're out here and you're getting a scribbly gum, it's automatic, automatic Rossii. You're just getting Rossii. You can't call it hemostoma. You can't call it signata. You're out here. So that's the inland scribbly gum. Uh, small fruits, uh, sort of different juvenile leaves, um, and you know, generally west of the Blue Mountains. It does, in that Canyon Lee area I'm talking about in Goulburn, Rossii does start to creep in, starts to creep in sort of through there. And Signata, that's known to be a north coast, northern New South Wales tree that I think punches on into Queensland. So, you know, you've got to be, looks like Port Stephens area to start getting, uh, or Newcastle to start getting Signata. So, um, you know, you sort of have to look up what the differences are. Uh, so remember the fruit. Uh, greater than or equal to seven mil wide, that's got to be hemostoma, or all, all other taxa narrower and generally less than seven mil. All have adult leaves to 15 centimetres long or so. Hemostoma signata to four centimetres wide. Racemosa rossii, I've seen descriptions to 1.5 centimetres wide. You can sometimes look at a scribbly gum canopy and it has very narrow leaves. Or the, the leaves look, you know, really narrow. you got to start to think it's Racemosa or Rossii when you get those narrow leaves. Um, but Sclerophylla had leaves uh, described to four centimetres wide, and that's now part of Racemosa. So this is probably rubbish now. Uh, look, that's what we're dealing with. Um, best determinations are on fruit width, leaf width, geographic area. Racemosa sub Racemosa versus sub Rossii. Differences are in the width of juvenile leaves and geographic location, as we saw, but there's probably some overlap and you might get some trees where you just say they're Racemosa Rossii intergrades, you know, they're just too hard to tell apart. So a bit difficult for accurate recording of botanical data in some cases. Just showing the juvenile leaves, I think they're helpful. These are the juvenile leaves of eucalyptus, what would have been called sclerophylla in Western Sydney. Juvenile leaves, um, red stems, they're nice and fat. They've got a really uh, sort of harsh texture or, or sort of really firm texture. You crush them up, you smell them, they've got a really good hit on them. And you see these saplings around and you think, you know, I've, I've probably got what was called eucalyptus sclerophylla, but I'm going to call it racemosa now. So always look out for those. They're really cool, the scribbly gum juveniles. And that's it for the scribbly gum. So I got through that. Look, I'm just going to get through one more species. And then we had a bit of theory at the start. In the next video, I'm just going to play us straight into plants. Uh, 
Punk Tata, another gum, another sandstone gum, but it also gets on much different substrate. But if you're on the Sydney sandstone, you're going to see it. But it also gets into valleys, uh, shale sandstone transition, other rocky sites. It really does love the rocky higher grounds in a lot of parts of New South Wales. Uh, it can also be found on shale soils in some habitats, so just straightforward shale. Um, you get this typical smooth, bumpy, grey-brown trunk. It's normally pretty distinctive. You get these really strong mosaic patterns of bark going on, different shades of brown, light grey, dark grey, browny grey. Uh, they're normally pretty distinctive. And sometimes they can have salmon patches, these really strong salmon patches, and I'll show those at the end. And a lot of people know and will tell you, if you've got a lot of punctata around, historically what has been said is it's prime koala habitat. Now, I think they've found koalas use a wide variety of trees, probably over 50 species or more, but... Punctata is a koala favourite. So if you've, if you've got an area with a lot of punctata, you should be looking out for koalas if you've got a lot of bush around. Um, it occurs through the coasts and tablelands, extending to the western slopes. It goes as far as Gympie in Queensland, down to the Nowra in New South Wales, and as far west as between Merriwa and Golgong, Hunter Valley or wider Hunter Valley, Candos Lithgow. So that's the range for punctata. Uh, they're the fruits, um, umbalasters in sevens. Uh, we've got leaves to 15 centimetres long, three centimetres wide. I find the fruits pretty conspicuous. They've sort of got a this nice genuine bowl shape with some exerted valves. Um, I don't know what it is about the fruit. I can't quite nail this. And every time I go on about something like this and I'm on a bushwalk, someone sort of links to me and tells me what you're thinking about what you what they yeah it's it's really helpful they sometimes they just remind me of something out of a like a, like a chess set like it's like the the head of the king or the or the or the bishop or something like that in some sort of chess set that I've played with I can't quite get my finger on it and maybe it's ringing a bell with you guys but they've got this sort of almost like this crown shaped um fruit which I always think is very distinctive. Sometimes I pick it up off the ground and go, hang on, what the hell is that? And then, you know, straight away you go, oh, hang on, it's just punctata. And you, and you look around and there's punctata trees around. So they normally got this, this just this, it's this distinctive looking fruit, I find. Um, to 12 mil long, 10 mil wide. And uh, I don't have any photos of the f uh, flowers actually, but I've got buds on the next slide. Um, I've just put here from my Botanic Gardens uh, collecting of eucalypts uh, to pay attention in the general Newcastle, Raymond Terrace, Hexham, Maitland, Lake Macquarie area up to Bulladilla. You get a total eucalyptus punctata lookalike, and that's called eucalyptus propinqua, and that's called the small fruited grey gum. And it has much smaller fruit than these guys, and it tends to hang out in swampy areas or sort of wet areas, but it also gets on the higher grounds as well. And it kicks in north, north of Sydney in this area. I had a mission to collect punctata around this area, and I just couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find it. Every tree, every record I rocked up to, they were eucalyptus propinqua. There's probably some punctata there, but you probably have to know where it is. They might even be growing together in some habitats, but I had a real nightmare here trying to discern punctata from propinqua. Um, so just look out for that in that part of the world. What I'm trying to do here and what I was trying to do in the workshop is, as I'm teaching you one uke, I can sort of teach you a second one. They look very similar. They've got the same trunk, they can have salmon colour, but if you get hold of the propinqua fruit, they're much smaller and, and sort of different looking. Uh, Alan Fairley's images of the um, flower buds, um, almost got a bit of a carimbia look to me, but it looks like the operculum is maybe about the same size as the hypanthium, about a one-to-one -one ratio there. Um, more ripe fruits in that case. Uh, so yeah, that's um, the, the leaves are green, discolorous. In that photo, they look a bit bluey green, but 
Uh, most of the time they tend to be a, a straight out green, I think, like sort of a mid green to dark green. You can just sometimes go to places and if you're like me, I'm sure you are, you try and figure out what the eucalypts are that are growing there if you get bored. Um, here's eucalyptus punctata growing around a playground at Oatley Park. So if you know Oatley Park in Sydney, um, it's a beautiful place for punctata. They've got all these remnant ones, sandstone outcrop over here. Um, plenty of punctata here to have a look at. There's the salmon patches. That's what I'm talking about. So they'll have an annual or biannual shedding of bark. And when they do, they can put on these beautiful salmon, almost Angophora costata-like colours. And, you know, this one looks sort of browny yellow, but you can get total salmon, like, like pinky, red. They can be very, very photographic and very conspicuous. Um, and sometimes the rain hits them and they turn an even darker colour. So look out for these salmon patches on Eucalyptus punctata. Um, quite quite distinctive, um, all, all that sort of mosaic, jagged bark, quite distinctive. So yeah, grey gums, they're, they're nice. Just a geographic distribution, I'm trying to throw this in every time, so that's down to Nara going out into the Hunter Valley. I've picked them up around Mudgee, uh, sort of out this way maybe. And they go out to Merriwa, which would be about here. Um, and as we said, they go up into Queensland, dropping out just up there. So you can see they got a bit of a coastal concentration, but they do get up into the tablelands as well. Um, they'll hang out with trees like Eucalyptus agglomerata, blue leaf stringy bark, and Eucalyptus seabri, which I'll talk about. Um, on the higher rocky grounds uh, around Canyon Lee and Goulburn and, uh, you know, Blangelo State Forest and uh, those sort of areas there where I hang out a lot. Um, even around Mudgee, I sort of grow in on the higher grounds, on the higher rocky ground with massive boulder outcrop, probably sandstone boulder growing with things like, again, eucalyptus agglomerata. So it likes to hang out with that tree in the sort of more inland areas. And I'm going to leave it there. That's 42 minutes. I'm going to wrap this one up. And in the next video, I'm just going to dive straight into species and keep going. So thanks for tuning in.